You're listening to Fresh Hope Today, episode 105. Well, welcome. Hi, I'm Brad Hafes, your host for Fresh Hope Today, and welcome to you. We're sure glad that you're taking time to listen to this, and we're praying that this podcast is a help to you. Uh, You know, one of the best ways that you and I can get better in our recovery and in our um, walk through this, the mental health issues that we might have in our lives, is really to um, hear the stories of other people. And um, hearing their stories many times will help you and me to, to pick up on something that, oh, yeah, that's, I identify with that. And to hear what another stories can give us encouragement and hope. Because, friend, we want to empower you to live a full and rich life in spite of having a mental health diagnosis. And um, sometimes we can be working with our psychiatrist and our counselor, as I did, and um, you end up feeling helpless. And sometimes you can end up feeling hopeless. And so we find that when peers talk to peers, and that's somebody who has a diagnosis with somebody else who has a diagnosis, that when we talk and when we share, There is such incredible insight and support there for one another. And uh, so that's our goal today. We we want to empower you to live a full and rich life. We want to give you hope that that there's hope and uh, you don't have to settle for being helpless with a mental health challenge. And um, both myself and Melody, who's joining me today, we both have a diagnosis and Both have walked through issues. I have bipolar one disorder and uh, can honestly say that for the last 12 to almost 13 years now, I've lived pretty much symptom free, nothing drastic, no major swings or hospitalizations. I haven't had to, to do anything but be proactive and take care of myself and do what what's necessary to kind of stay on top of it. And uh, it's quite possible to do that. Welcome, Melody. Hi. You you too have bipolar disorder, if I yes. remember right. Yes. Correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm glad that you're here. Um, I appreciate your willingness to do this. And um, just go ahead, Melody, introduce our listeners to who you are and um, tell them a little bit about your journey, maybe about your family. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a mother of three, and I'm married for almost 31 years. Ah, congratulations. Thanks. Um, my journey started when I was pretty young. I, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into detail over things that happened, but you might notice this in your life. I was, um, molested at a very young age, um, got into some pornography, uh, just a lot of, a lot of, um, <laughs> sorry, I was telling her to move her microphone. So <laughs> go ahead, Melody. Yeah. Uh, a lot of things, and when I was sixteen, I was I was diagnosed as depressed and suicidal. Uh-huh. But I can see that's when I was starting where the bipolar was starting to um, take a hold. And I did a lot of drugs, a lot of hard drugs, what like LSD, or and I smoked pot on a daily basis. I drank a little bit. I was self medicating. Sure. I just sure. I just hurt so deep. Uh, but yeah, I had those really heavy. Um, swings between being real high and being real low. Uh, what would happen when you were real high? What what was that like? Um, I was very energetic. Uh, I was a little promiscuous. Okay. Uh, I think that's, those were the two. Uh, I got things done. I'm very creative. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people think when they think mania, they think somebody out there running up and down the streets you know, just wild and crazy, you know. But mania can be just surges of energy. Mm-hmm. It can be surges of productivity, uh, surges of creativity. Um, 
And for some, if they're bipolar two, I don't know if you're bipolar one or two, you're bipolar one. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who are bipolar two, many times the diagnosis is missed and they're just yes. being treated as being um, depressed mm -hmm. with major depressive disorder and they're not getting better. I've heard a psychiatrist say that um, if, if uh, you're not better in 90 days after taking medicine for just simple Mm -hmm. clinical depression mm -hmm. that you need to fire your doctor something's mm -hmm. wrong and um you know the the cycling in and out of depression and feeling somewhat normal and feeling okay too is cycling and so mm -hmm. that that's a different aspect of bipolar disorder and and people will say well i've never had the mania i've never had the ups i've never well quite honestly Bipolar is really a cycling mood disorder. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily that you go way up and way low. That's one kind, but you can cycle in and out. So I think it's important for people to understand other people's mania. You know, I think <clears throat> as I've gotten older, my um, mania has gotten worse. I have uh, the last time over four and a half years ago, I had a lot of psychosis, and it started in in uh, November until I was hospitalized in February. That uh, is, my family just about went nuts, didn't oh, know what to do with me. Yeah. What, what kind of psychosis? <laughs> when you say psychosis, what do you mean? Well, let's see. I put around the front door all this stuff, like survival stuff, mm -hmm. for people that were going to come and needed it, because it, it was a bad winter that year. Um, and I was going to send them two doors down to these other Christians, and they would take care of them. I mean, I had bought evaporated milk, um, you know, all kinds of survival. Yes. Things, huh? And then this, and I told my husband, you know, there's going to be a Latino um, couple that's going to come and she's not going to be very old, but we're going to deliver the baby and it's going to be named Jesus. Um, oh, okay. Those are the types of things that I would do, or I would do experiments. Well, I thought they were experiments, mm -hmm. um, like Sir Isaac Newton. Okay. You know, and it, my family just, <laughs> they didn't know what to think. Well, it was, yeah, yeah. Do you remember that? Do yes. Do you remember doing those things? Yes. And, and so you just felt, um, did you hear voices or did you feel just impressions? And, impressions. Okay. Just yeah. really strong. Yeah. I even unplugged my, undid my husband's computer, all of it, and I hid it out in the garage. And I told him I was sorry about, ha I was tired of having that cash cow, I called it. Uh, okay. Because he did all of his business and okay. stuff on there. And sure. <laughs> those oh, are, yeah. Those are, oh, he was angry. Oh, I'm sure he was. <laughs> so how did you end up in the hospital then? I really lost it one day and called my husband every name in the book. I was screaming at him. Uh -huh. And I said, just take me to the hospital. It's got to be better than being here. And I mm. went and got my coat, sat in the pickup. What it did to my daughter that still lived at home, it screwed, it messed her up so bad that when I was being released from the hospital, she says, if mom's coming home, I'm leaving. Oh, my. And so I didn't get come home for another week. I had stayed with friends. Because they had to figure it out. Yeah, we had to figure out, you know, what we we're going to do with my yeah, daughter. And, yeah. and it took a greater part of two years before we were back to where we were before mm, I went in. Yeah. But it, now it's better than ever. Yeah. Because I've helped educate them. And did you hear what she just said? It's better than ever. Um, the truth is, if you and I will but work at our recovery, if we will but choose to take our life back and do the things that we know will give us a better life and uh, uh, become uh, more whole and... Uh, we can we can be empowered to live a full and rich life in spite of having mm -hmm. this. Another thing that happened to me was I was misdiagnosed for about fourteen years. Yeah. I would I landed at Richard Young when that used to be here uh, all summer off and on, and then I was sent to Norfolk Regional Center because I'd hurt myself so bad that um, I got committed um, by the state. Okay. Uh, and then when I was done with. Um, Norfolk Regional Center, they took away the commitment and just said that I'd be living with my husband. Okay. So, I mean, I had a little trial and everything where they commit oh, you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where the state takes over. Mm -hmm. or the, yeah. Now, tell me this. 
you said you were misdiagnosed for 14 years, mm-hmm. meaning they just had you as depressed? Or? Major depressive disorder with anxiety and PTSD. Okay. But now with the bipolar uh, piece, when they figured that out, they started giving you a mood stabilizer. Mm-hmm. and then It made the world a difference. I slept better. <laughs> okay. I'm more, I still have little ups and downs, but like a normal person would have. Ah, normal. What's well, normal? Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> well, it doesn't um, impede your living. It doesn't yeah. uh, interfere with your daily. You mm-hmm. know, that that's what's important because everybody has mood swings. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody has issues, and certainly everyone has emotional issues, mm-hmm. which is different than the the brain dysfunction mm-hmm. issues that you and I might have uh, based upon chemistry or. Mm-hmm based upon the dysfunction of the brain itself. Now, how did you end up coming to Fresh Hope? Well, the church had a sign out front that said Fresh Hope. um, And I just, I drove by it so many times and I thought, you know, I'm just going to go check it out. Ah. That was about four, about four years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I, I came every, just about every week. So for those of you who are listening, um, I I started a group five and a half years ago, the first Fresh Hope group at the time of this recording. It's five and a half years. Um, but um, And we had a sign out front of the church. And so Melody was really almost one of the original members mm-hmm. of the, the first go around with Fresh Hope. Yeah. And so what brought you back? You came in the first time. I felt comfortable. I felt like I wasn't being judged for the first time because of my mental health um, diagnosis and that people really understood. Had you tried other support groups or? Uh, Yeah. What did you find? What is the difference, if you will, between what you experienced prior to Fresh Hope and after coming to the Fresh Hope recovery? A lack of hope. There was a lack of hope in the other groups. Yes, because it wasn't Christ centered. Mm-hmm. It was it was man centered, and it was also that medical model that you talk about, mm-hmm. where you're never going to get any better. You'll yeah. you know it's all- learned helplessness. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, so talk to me about why you connect Christ and hope. What what is the connection there? What uh, our hope and fresh hope comes from Christ. And it's found it, or uh, where we find it in Him, in Him alone. Mm-hmm. What, but what does that mean, really, to you? What does that? Why is there hope in that? I might have to. Um, let me see. I grew up in a very spiritual atmosphere, mm-hmm. um, and so I kind of know what you know kind of know what it's about it was legalistic but i was brought up um in a nice in a religious well, a spiritual home spiritual Mm -hmm. and i always and i learned it then but it didn't really make sense until i started coming to fresh hope oh really yeah yeah i felt all shame and guilt okay yeah because it was more legalistic or more law oriented so to speak, and so you felt like you were failing at all the Mm -hmm. things. And that's what changed from how I was brought up to coming to Fresh Hope, that the first time I was told there is hope, Mm -hmm. you know, from that, before I came, it was like there was no hope, and I was going to a therapist, you know, it was clear from 1996 to just about four years ago. Which would be 2010. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have went back every once in a while for a, a tune-up, mm-hmm. you might say, but I never go back more than once. Mm-hmm. I just need that tune-up, maybe a little um, pat on the back, you know, that I'm sure. doing okay. Sure. Going back to the issue of hope in Christ, mm-hmm. um, what I find is that without Christ— we only have wishful thinking yes. that things will get better. Um, we don't really have that secure um, fact that, you know, it will be all right through him. You know, without mm-hmm. that, you have wishful thinking, and wishful thinking, as hard as you might try to be positive about things, doesn't really give hope in my thinking. Yeah. And for me, what makes us different 
than uh, groups that don't share the faith part of it necessarily. I realize that groups allow people to have, you know, they can talk about their own faith, but where where it's different is we actually encourage one another with hope, mm-hmm. and that is the hope that we have in Christ. And what is that hope? That hope is that he will absolutely take our situation and make it work for our good because he loves us. Mm-hmm. And even when I'm feeling down and I'm at my worst, that can give me hope. Mm-hmm. Because if I know who Christ is and that it's sure and certain, I don't have to feel hopeful. Right. I can choose hope. Yes. <laughs> and that won't change my feelings necessarily, but ultimately um, to know that he's going to take my situation. He, and, and friend, if you're listening today and you're in a hopeless situation and you feel hopeless, that's okay. We understand. We have been there. Mm-hmm. And um, we are not saying that you shouldn't feel that way. You can mm-hmm. feel that way. You got to work through those feelings. You got to deal with those things. But more than anything, to understand that there is hope because of Jesus, and that Romans eight twenty eight, He can take all things and make them work together for your good. I find that you can't separate us. We're spiritual. We're physical. We're emotional. And so often in some settings, you, we separate everything, you know. This is where you go for the spiritual things. This is where you go yeah. for the emotional or the psychological things. Well, I find that I need my faith to override my emotions and my feelings and my moods at times. Mm-hmm. One of the things that um, a positive by- byproduct of hope uh, that people can see is you have a new joy and peace about you that you didn't have yeah. before you came in. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And I've hung on to that verse um, for a long time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, I think, too, one of the things that you probably experienced that you're describing at least uh, you tell me if I'm, I've got this right, um, is that when you came to Fresh Hope, what you found was forgiveness mm-hmm. and grace and mercy. And, you know, hope really resides in all of that. Mm-hmm. Because if, I'm, if, I, if I have the, uh, God's love unconditionally, I have hope. Mm-hmm. And I find the longer... Um, I went and I watched others the longer they went. That hope, um, the thing where we go from empty to full, where your hope tank is, it kind of edges up as as a person is there. You You begin to understand some of the choices that Mm -hmm. you have and can make. Yeah, yeah. So you came to Fresh Hope, and uh, you've been around for four years. Yeah. Um, How are you doing in your recovery right now? How how is it working? How is it? How are you doing? I handle the ups and downs of life a lot better. Although, you know, I don't cycle down or up as much. Mm -hmm. But I am able to, I've gotten tools, you might say. And what what might some of those be? What are some of those things that you could share with our listeners? Um, I gotta think. My my thought life and what I'm going to think about, um, that has been one tool. Another tool is um, not to shame myself <laughs> to yes. get to get past that. Um, shame is a little bit different than guilt. Guilt says, you know, I oh, I did a bad thing and and I should be punished or mm-hmm. I will be punished. And shame says um, I'm no good. Mm-hmm. I'm not a I I'm just a no good person mm-hmm. that I'm I'm worthless. Instead um, of saying to yourself. Well, you know, everyone makes mistakes. I didn't make a good choice there, but that's Mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to learn from it. And then learning to make good choices, you know, when coming to Fresh Hope, but learn that is to make positive choices. And, you know, the more you do that, actually it comes out in your feelings. The better you feel, Mm -hmm. you know, when you get your thinking um, going the right way, you start feeling it, you Mm -hmm. know, and then you start acting different. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that's that byproduct I talk about. Right. You, know, you actually it. act upon how you feel and what you believe. And so if your filtering system in your brain's got some stinking thinking in there, you got to <laughs> get rid of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned your first tool was uh, learning to, to really think on certain things and mm -hmm. not allow yourself to go down the hole, if you will, of depressive thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, Paul talks about taking captive Everything. our thinking and think on these things. Mm -hmm. And it may seem like it's impossible to do. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I would say there were points in when I was severely, uh, just terribly, terribly depressed and um, that I could barely think much mm -hmm. less decide what I was going to think about. Mm -hmm. So it became something I had to do almost every second. I mm -hmm. just had to, sh to, to just grit my teeth and say, I choose hope and mm -hmm. I'm not going <laughs> to think about that. You know, it, it's hard to not ruminate on mm -hmm. how terrible things are. One of the things I've done for over probably 25 years is I journal. But the difference between then and now is when I um, journal, after a couple of days, I pull them out and I rip them up, throw them away. I'm not going to stay. If it was a stinking thinking or mm -hmm. really depressed or something, I'm not going to stay there. I choose to change. And so I got it out in black and white, huh. got it outside myself so I wasn't, like you said, mm -hmm. ruminating over it. And then I tear it up. Uh, and I think uh, those of you who are listening, my friend, please note, she just said, I'm going to change. I choose to change. I choose to move beyond this. Mm -hmm. I'm not stuck here forever. This, I can change. Christ can change me. I can change my thinking. Mm -hmm. You may not be able to change your circumstances. Right. But he's he's really, he wants to love us in those circumstances and show that even in our worst of circumstances, we can have peace and peace of mind. Mm -hmm. huh? I think another thing I learned um, on a deeper level was about forgiveness of myself and others that may have hurt me in some way. I not only, this is something I picked up along the way, when I forgive somebody, um, I don't, I just, I don't just forgive them. I actually go on to pray. If they don't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, would you send people into their lives? Mm -hmm. um, and I pray a blessing on their life mm -hmm. because I feel like that's being like Jesus. Oh, you know, I'm just God. going beyond forgiveness. And do you, do you think that any unforgiveness ha affected possibly your mental health itself? Yes. It, yes. Bitterness. Can, Bitterness, yes. Yeah. Takes a lot of emotional energy to be bitter. Yeah, and there's just such a release when you when I've done that. And and forgiveness is really not about the other person. Yeah. It's really about you, right? Yeah. It's uh, bitterness or unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to <laughs> die. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah, you find yourself in a spiritual prison, as it says in the Bible, if you don't forgive. Mm -hmm. You know. And, you know, I think sometimes we who have a diagnosis feel like we're always the ones who cause the problems. We're always the ones that need the forgiveness. And certainly yeah. there are times where that's true. Our be but our loved ones sometimes hurt us by their reactions to mm -hmm. our mental health challenges mm -hmm. and issues, right? Yes, and I have a very understanding husband. And I've asked for forgiveness different times, and he does not even waver a bit. He do, he says, "I accept your apology." I you know, and mm -hmm. it, the slate is wiped clean between us. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice thing too that Praise I have God. that at home. Yeah, some of you might not have that, mm -hmm. and uh, that makes it difficult because that's a wounding back at you, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it's it's unforgiveness in that situation or forgiving them for not forgiving you mm -hmm. and wiping it clean is it's just so important to do because uh, I find that wounded people wound other people, hurt mm -hmm. people hurt people, you know. And um, when we don't have that environment where someone says to us, you know, I forgive you, the slate is clean, um, when they don't do that and they say, well, blah, 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 it's so hard mm -hmm. to forgive them. But 
you know, it's one of those things, if, if you and I will but forgive when we're in those situations, it can change us in that circumstance. It mm-hmm. can change our hearts and, you know. The hardest thing, and I know it's this way for just about everybody, is to forgive yourself. Oh, yes. Because we think we don't live up to our own standards, and so we it's that shame again. Absolutely. You know? A lot of us, and I always say, I'm going to write a book called Shame-Based Grace, Mm -hmm, and identifying shame-based grace versus true grace, Mm -hmm. because shame-based grace really is what we do to ourselves. We, you know, um, I shouldn't, I, I couldn't, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have thought that I, you know, and where Jesus says, I understand, I forgive you. Now move on. Mm-hmm. You know. I just had an aha moment. <laughs> oh. It's like we talked on a different time about when I go home from, I teach, I do a facilitated small group, uh, that when I do that, well, I shouldn't have done that. I could have done that different. And I'm like, <laughs> that, that's when I, I really do that too. You know? Yeah. I you don't just for, hold yourself. Yes. And then I, you know, hold it in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so easy to do, isn't it? Mm-hmm. One of the key things that I've learned about in my own recovery and has really stuck for me um, in the last 10 years is to get to that point where I say, okay, I messed up. Shouldn't have done that. Just recently, I sent out an email to leaders asking them to consider the church purchasing something. And even as I did it, I thought, well, you know, mm-hmm. this isn't a top priority for me, but I'd like this to happen, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I stated my case in the email, and oh, the first couple of emails came back like, what are you, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> no, we're not going to do this, uh-huh. or I don't want to do this through an email, and blah, blah, blah. And instead of shaming myself and saying, well, I should have known better, and or getting um, kind of a forceful back and say, well, you know, mm-hmm. that would have been yeah. old patterns for me um, and tried to manipulate it. Mm-hmm. I found myself saying, no, I think they're right. You know, they still love me. They just gave me their opinion on yeah. this particular thing. Mm-hmm. They're not calling me a bad person or they're not saying, well, you're a bad leader or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's so easy to do that, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, Melody, it's been a, a joy to watch what God is doing in your life. Thanks. I, I, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to, to be part of your life. Thanks. Yeah. Now, could you just speak for a few minutes just to, to somebody who's listening to this, to the, to the person who's sitting there saying, I'm hopeless, I, I don't know. Share some hope with them. I certainly understand, and there is hope. There's always hope, and God's hope doesn't disappoint. It's just as if it's a it's a daily thing. We don't have to wish for it like we've talked earlier. Um, there is hope and there is a place that you can go if you can find a fresh hope or even go online. Um, sure. And, and more than anything, don't give up. Yeah, don't just give keep up. going. When you're going through hell, you don't stop. Right. You keep taking one step after another and you push through ultimately. If you stop, you end up at that point, and that's not a good point. You don't want to end up there. Yeah. But uh, my friend, I want you to know today that it is possible to live a full and rich life in spite of having a mental health challenge. Sometimes it feels as though we can't go on. And that's when you have to say, okay, I don't want to go on. I feel like I can't. I don't even feel like God's here. But there's a choice to be made at that point. And at that point, you have to say, I choose hope. I choose to believe. I choose to believe that Jesus is going to take my circumstances and change it. Because that's his promise. He will. And you will get through it, even though you feel like you might not. You will get through it. There is hope, my friend. There is hope. And it's fresh and new every day. So hold on to that. Thank you, Melody, for Thank sharing. You. If you'd like encouragement, contact us at info at freshhope.us. We'd be happy to help you in any way possible. God bless you.
This has been a production of Fresh Hope Ministries. For more information, go to freshhope.us. Thank you.